welcome to our verse-by-verse -verse journey through the book of James. One of the things the Bible teaches us is that God's people should not live like the people who do not believe in God. The Bible was given to us by God for the purpose of knowing Him and for knowing the right way to live. And to live in a way that glorifies God, that blesses others, and that grows faith. To live any other way is to live the wrong way. Most people in the world around us have chosen to reject God and His Word. And we are surrounded by people who have chosen to live the wrong way. And it's our hope that we can all learn through this study how to live right in this wrong way world. The book of James is one of the most practical books in the Bible. The primary theme of James is the relationship between faith and works, between what we believe and what we do. Our goal for this series is to grow in our knowledge, understanding, and experience of God. We also want to cooperate with the Holy Spirit as He works to conform us to the image of Christ. And finally, as the world goes the wrong way, we want to learn how to live the right life that Jesus died to give us. So, grab a cup of coffee, open your Bible to the book of James as we discover how to live right in a wrong way world. James chapter 2. Sorry, I got it. As we continue our series, Living Right in a Wrong World. And last week I shared a message in the Biblical Worldview series on the topic of tribalism and the us versus them consequences of a worldview that rejects God and His Word. If you take God and His Word out and you follow man's ways of viewing the world and doing things, it will always set you against other people. That is just the natural consequence of rejecting God and his word because it's human nature. It's the nature within us that, that does that. And you, we need something else in that place. We need God and his word to help us to, to, to relate to the rest of these weird people around us, right? Anybody got a weird person around you? Don't look, don't look. We were created with a soul deep need to be in community, to be connected to other people, and, and not just connected on Facebook, okay? To be really connected in a, in a life-sharing relationship. We need to be a part of a tribe, in a, in a, in a tribe where we feel like we belong there, like, we, like we're a part of it. We need that. And when we don't have it, it's a, it creates a sense of distress and, and emptiness and, and longing for something that, you know, we need it. It's not something we want. It's something we need deep down in our soul. Two weeks ago, James introduced the idea, the concept, which is the, really the primary concept of the book of James, that true faith... Faith in God and, and his word is going to show up in the way we live our lives. It's going to show up in what we're going to refer to as works. When, when we're doing something, that our faith is manifested, is revealed in there. And if we have real faith in God and his word, that's going to show up. And if it's not showing up, then, then there, is a, there is a question mark, you know, as it relates to your faith. Do you have real faith or not? And he said boldly that if your faith isn't doing something, that it's dead, meaning lifeless. There's no life coming out of your faith. And, and we understand that's, that's what we're supposed to be producing, that we're living in a world that is, that is spiritually dead for the most part. And the only way there's going to be any spiritual life in this world is if God's people are bringing it into the world. And so we have a, we have a mandate before God, a good mandate. There are good mandates. We have a mandate before God to bring him, to show him, to reveal him, to, to be a reflection of him out into this world. That's the only way life, true spiritual life is going to come to this world. So James is going to talk to us about something today that should be absent from our faith. 
There's something, there's something that something in our lives that shouldn't be there. And interestingly, this thing is one of the signs of godless tribalism. There is good tribalism, but godless tribalism is any of that that, that leaves God out of it. And so, we're, so the the point, the main thing is that we understand is that what James is going to talk about over and over and over again is that how we treat people matters. How we treat, especially people who are outside of our tribe or outside of, of, of being like us, who are different than we are, who are not, who are not um, maybe we, we deem to be less important than others. And, and how we treat those people says a lot about what we believe about God. It is a manifestation, it's a reflection, it's a, it is a declaration of our faith, the way we treat people outside of our tribe. It's important how we treat the ones inside our tribe too, so don't get me wrong, both of those matter. Living right in this wrong way world involves us seeing and relating to or treating people the right way as divinely created image bearers of God, regardless of what they're doing, regardless of how they're acting, regardless of how they're treating you, regardless of what political part of the end, what, what they think is true or right, or, and regardless of any of that stuff, they are first and foremost divinely created image bearers of God. And if we forget that, and we treat them any, anything other than that, then we're missing the mark. And it will affect the way that we treat them. And in essence, it will be a reflection upon our faith. And to do that, we need to look. We need to examine ourselves. And we need to ask ourselves the question, am I treating the peop the way, people the way that I ought to be, the way God would have me to? Or am I treating them the wrong way? Living right in this wrong way world is not easy. Anybody want, the, anybody want to know the easy way to live this life? Uh, you're in the wrong place. The Bible says very clearly the easy way is the wrong way. The easy way actually leads to destruction. So any, any church you go to says I, three easy steps to live the perfect life, uh, you're probably in the wrong church. It's not easy. But it's the way to the fullness of God's blessing. It's the way to experience the fullness of God's presence in your life. It's the way to experience all of the good that God has is by doing it the right way. And yeah, it's harder to do it the right way. It always is. They pick anything in life. It's almost always harder to do it the right way than it is to do it the easy way. So let's pray. And we'll ask the Holy Spirit to help us to, to, to see this. How do we treat people the right way, even if it's not the easy way? Heavenly Father, we come thanking you for this your word, and we ask for a blessing upon this time that we spend together. And we ask, Lord God, that you'd open our hearts and minds. Lord God, that we would see clearly that, 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 that we may be looking at people the wrong way. And if we are, that Lord God, that we need to change our hearts. We need to let you change our hearts because, because you have a way that you see them that if we're going to say that we are your people, that we need to try to see them that way also. And so I pray, Lord, that you'd minister our hearts right where we are right now, that we might be able to, to live a life that is good and right and brings glory to you and blessing to others and grows faith all around us. We thank you, Lord, for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. So jump right in in James chapter 2, verse 1. My brethren, this is James speaking to believers, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. James ended chapter 1 telling us that our religion ought to be pure and undefiled, that, that we ought to make sure that the way we're practicing this thing we call Christianity is right, 
is pure, is not being corrupted by things from the outside. And, and we see that all through the church. That, that, that there are really some really weird things are showing up in churches. And, and they're corrupting the simple gospel of Jesus Christ with, with social justice and all of these things, which on the, on the, you know, which some, at some point they're pointing at something important, but they're doing it the wrong way. We need to keep our faith pure and undefiled because if our faith is pure, is not pure and undefiled, then our religion, the religion is what comes out of our faith. And if our religion, if our, if our faith is not pure, then our religion is not pure. And it says we need to make sure that partiality isn't creeping into our faith and coming out in our works. And, and listen, all of these things, if we, if we are be honest, we'll say that there is, a, there is a little bit of that in there. Almost all of us could probably point to a little bit of, of some of these things going on in our faith. Partiality is the unfair bias in favor of one thing or person compared with another favoritism is what it says. Listen, one of our goals is to be like Jesus, right? I, I mean, that's why we call ourselves Christians. And be Christ-like. I want to be like Christ because that's what God says I'm supposed to do. So I'm going to try to be like Christ. Well, that, that's as much about being, about being certain things and not being other things. It, it, there is, you know, people, you know, it's all about do's and don'ts with you Christians. No, 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 not really. It's about being. But there is some not being in there too. There's some things I have to leave out. I have to omit from my life if I'm going to be a my Christian because those things were not present in Christ's life, so they shouldn't be present in my life. One of those is partiality. That if I'm going to be like Christ, if I'm going to be like God the Son, then I need to leave certain things out of my life. And one of them is partiality. Romans 2.11 says this about God. There is no partiality with God. How much is there? None. No partiality. That God doesn't play favorites. He says they're all, you, 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 he says in several places that they're, you're, okay, you're all to be treated, I treat you all the same. The, the, the outcome comes different be based on our faith, but he, he looks at us as the same. In fact, he calls it unjust and unrighteous. In Leviticus, I've got to get to Leviticus every now and then, 1915, you shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. In righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. That we need to treat people, that we don't look at their outward appearance. We don't look at the stuff that we can see or, or we understand from their social media account. We don't look at those things and make a determination of good versus evil that way. We don't treat them differently based on that. We have a different way of viewing these things. James gives a practical example of partiality in the continuation of the text. Verse 2, for, there shall, it, for if there shall come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in, the good, in a good place and say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Yeah, a, a more modern translation or illustration might be, you know, somebody pulls up in a brand new Bentley. You guys know what a Bentley is, right? High-end luxury car. Or they come in a 1996 Honda Civic missing the front bumper and the AC doesn't work and hasn't been washed in the last decade. And you treat that one with the Bentley differently than you do with the one, the, the Honda. Nobody, nobody's driving a 1996 Honda, are they? No, you're not. <laughs> are you? <laughs> I want one. <laughs> I just randomly picked something. I knew I got to pick something, you know, at least 25 years old because who knows. But if we treat them differently, we look at them and say, oh, Brand new Bentley. That, that dude's got some money. <laughs> he could tithe really good. <laughs> you know, he could, he could pay to get rid of my old car. And, you know, and 
No, we start, he's saying that's what, that's what we do. We look at them and we start making judgments based on, on these outward appearances. And he's saying that, that, that's wrong when we do that. And pick any way of evaluating people based on, on these different ways of, of measuring and determining things. If we pick one of these things and say, well, this person is that, so I'm going to treat them this way. That person, oh, they're not like that, so I'm, I'm going to treat them differently. It's not right. It's born out of evil thoughts. Typically, you know, what, what benefit they will serve me or the ministry or my cause or whatever. It's judging people based on something that I can see, that I can interpret, something on the outside and not on who they are in God's kingdom, not on, based on how God sees them. The implication there and the, and the implication of this text and, and the same thing is true of how we might do this is that is that the rich man's soul is actually of more value than the poor man's soul. And then we would never say that out loud. Why? Because that's wicked. That's evil. And yet our actions may actually be saying that. Not yours. I'm speaking to those other people. Money, power, status, you know, Followers on social media, pick some way of measuring, some human form of measurement that does not determine a person's worth or righteousness. It, that's not what God uses to determine those things. Verse 5, listen, my beloved brethren, has not God chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? He's basically saying that the poor have just as much a right to the kingdom of God as the rich do. That, there is, that, that God, doesn't, God doesn't evaluate it that way. That they are actually rich in faith. And, 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 and reality is because the poor... In this, in this context, and we can use lots of different other contexts, but the, in this context is the poor tend to depend upon their faith in God much more than the rich do. The rich tend to, in, tend to trust in what? Their riches or their power or whatever they have an abundance of. They, they will, again, it's, it's human nature. They will tend to trust in those things. Jesus said, what do you, what do you say about the rich? It's hard for them to enter the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because their natural tendency is to trust in their riches rather than in faith, rather than in God. And so it's important to understand that. It doesn't mean they can't. It's just harder. And the natural tendency of the poor is because they don't have anything else to trust in, is to trust in God. I have to, I got nothing else. I got to trust in God. So the poor are rich in heaven. We're going to talk about rewards a little bit later on, but you know, we, we recognize that the Bible teaches that rewards are based on faith. That, that what we believe in this world, what we do as an expression of our faith, believing and trusting in God is going to be rewarded in heaven. And the, and the sense here that we get from this text is that the poor, because they tend to depend on their, on their faith, more readily and more quickly and, and, and more consistently are probably going to get a greater reward in heaven than the rich will. So while they're poor in this world, they're rich in heaven because they depend so heavily upon their faith. So if you're poor today, just trust God and rejoice because <laughs> your reward in heaven is great. Verse 6. But you have dishonored the poor, the poor man, when you, when you show partiality. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? Partiality is something we need to watch out for. The sense here is that, that partiality is blasphemy because it, it uses human judgments to evaluate how worthy someone is of heaven, of Christ's sacrifice, of, of salvation. 
using some way of evaluating, oh, this poor man, you stay over there because you're not as worthy of Christ as, you know, as Larry is. Well, not, he's not rich, but I'm praying for you. I want you to get rich. Listen, a rich person is no more worthy of Christ's sacrifice than the poorest poor person. A person's social standing, their race, their gender, their identity, their marital status, their social status, their, you know, whatever, whatever way you might want to evaluate or determine or any, any other thing does not determine their worthiness of salvation. None of those things do. And so to use any of those things to, to, to differentiate how you're going to treat people. I'm going to treat this person because they're in this group. You know, I'm going to treat Democrats different than Republicans. You know, because you're a Democrat, I'm sorry. You need to go sit over there. You need to sit at my footstool because, you know, you're, you know, lesser. That's wrong. James says, verse 8, if you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. This phrase, royal law, only occurs in this one spot. Though what he's pointing to, the next phrase, you shall love your neighbor yourself, is repeatedly in the New Testament, all through the New Testament, also in the Old Testament. It's a, it's a law for us. Partiality looks on the outside and makes, makes determinations on how I'm going to relate to someone, how I'm going to treat them in relation to whatever it might be based on something that I can see or determine or measure on the outside. But God looks at the heart. In 1 Samuel 16, 7, the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have re refused him. For the Lord does not see it as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Only God can see what's on the inside. Only God can see the heart. Even, I mean, we're not, even, we're not even able to see our own heart. Only God can see the human heart. And so the logic here is, and it makes good logical sense, since we can't see what is inside someone else's heart, then we need, we're told to love them as ourselves. So I don't know, I don't, I can, I can see what you're doing. I can see what you're wearing. I can see what you're, I can hear what you're saying. I can see what you're posting on social media, but I don't know what's in your heart. But God does. And so the way that I relate to you has got to be, I have to relate to you. I have to love you as I love myself. And since I only love myself one way, right? I only love myself one way. Then everybody else around me needs to be loved how many different ways? One. I love them, whoever they are, whatever their, whatever their outward stuff is. I love them the same way. And since, and since James is focused on faith that works, the idea there is we don't need to feel love for others, but we're called to do works of love. What would love require here? And the obvious question then becomes, well, if I'm not supposed to love my neighbor, then who is my neighbor? Well, thankfully, Jesus was asked that question, right? If you remember that. In Luke 10, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Anybody remember it? Somebody say, yes, I remember it. I know you guys do. The, the conclusion of that parable that we draw from it, the application of that parable, is that, that we are called to love any needy human that God gives us an opportunity to help. That if God puts somebody in front of us and that, and that human, and that's the only qualification, is they're human. If he puts them in front of us, then, then there's, there's a possibility he's calling us to help them. 
Three things, three things we need to help somebody. Opportunity, that means God puts them in front of us, gives us an opportunity to help them. Ability, because sometimes an opportunity presents itself, a need presents itself, and we have no ability, right? Recognize that? And then third, permission. Because the reality is there are way more needy humans around us than we have the opportunity or the ability to help. We have to recognize that God may put somebody in front of, our, in front of us. He wants us to be willing to help them, but he may not give us the ability. Even if he gives us the ability, he may not give us permission. And we need to be seeking him. God, so we see somebody in need, and, and we think, okay, God, I, I, you know, I, see the, I see the opportunity to help. I have the ability to help. Do you want me to? Because God may say no. Do you know why he might say no? Because he's given you a limited amount of resources, and he may have your, those resources allocated somewhere else. Or he knows that if you were to give this person or do this thing, it would not actually help them. Right? Anybody ever help somebody that didn't actually help them? I mean, the older I get, the more often it happens. I help somebody and they, they are not helped. Matter of fact, it makes things worse. Opportunity, ability, and permission. All three of those line up and you go and you go Full tilt, Give, do everything you think God's telling you to do. And all of that has to be regardless of what you see on the outside. All the stuff that we may judge them by, all the things we may evaluate them by, if God gives you the opportunity and the ability and the permission, nothing else matters. Doesn't matter what you think they might do with the help you give them. Doesn't matter what they look like or what they do or how they disagree with you. Or, none of that matters. If God gives you the opportunity, has given you the ability, and then tells you, gives you permission to do it, you've got to do it. And to not do it because of some outward appearance is partiality. And why do we do it? Well, because of love. Love is the key. Love is the key for everything we should do in this life. Love is God's nature. 1 John 4, 7, and 8. And there's a song about this. Beloved, let us love one another, for God is love. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. If we call ourselves believers, if we call ourselves disciples of Jesus Christ, followers of Christ, Christians, then love has to be present in our lives. People have to be able to see love coming out of us in the way. It has to be the motivation, has to be the desire. Everything we do has to be revolve around love. Why? Because that's what God is. God is love and everything that he does, everything that he is, is love. That's his motivation for how he relates to mankind. Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners... Christ died for us while we were outside of God's tribe. Jesus died for us. So those people outside of your tribe, what would God call you to do for them? He's not going to probably not call you to die for them, but he might call you to die to yourself for them. Love is how he expects us to relate to other people. John 13, 34 and 35, a new commandment I give to you, Jesus speaking, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, it's specifically Christian to Christian, but it ultimately elsewhere, he says, love your enemies. Do good to those who persecute you, spitefully use you. Responding to the needs of others without partiality is one of the proofs that God's love is in you. If we're showing partiality, that means there's a question mark. Right? Do you, does God, do you actually love God? Because if you love God and God has poured his love out into you, then that ought to be coming out in everything that we're doing. 
1 John 3, 16, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. If we recognize Jesus died for our sins, then we need to be willing to express love through our sacrificial acts of love to others. Whatever the circumstances, whatever the situation. And if, and if someone is treating others with partiality, then they're breaking the royal law. Verse 9. If you show partiality, you commit sin. Well, that's not very soft and gentle, squishy. And are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you commit adultery, but do, you do, if you do not commit adultery, excuse me, but you do commit murder, it's interesting that he puts them in that order, you have become a transgressor of the law. Showing partiality is not loving. It's not loving your neighbor as yourself. It is, it is James says, sin. Now, now we, we have a funny way of viewing sin. Humans have a funny way. We're going to do anything we can to make my sin not that big of a deal, right? I mean, we, we, we do everything we can to make my sin small and my sin big. You know, because then I'm okay. If, if I'm not sinning as bad as Miles is, then I'm doing okay. And we have this idea of, of how sin works. You know, we, 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 you know, you've you ever seen the scales of justice, right? You know, you know that, that's how it works. It, 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 if, you know, if, if, my, if my good outweighs my bad, then I'm good. You know, if, if, I, if, if, I, if I've done more good than bad, then, then God is happy with me. If I've done more good than bad, then I, can get, to go, I get to go to heaven. And that's how we, how we do it. And we do everything we can to make sure our good is better than our bad. The problem is, that's not how it works. It doesn't work anything like that. We have to understand that there is this distance between God and man. God is perfect and holy and righteous in all ways. And man is not. And so what God did is he created this great chain that connects us, that connects broken, sinful, weak, imperfect man with perfect God. And it is the chain of the law. God gave humanity clear description. We don't want to just limit just to the Ten Commandments. You know, that, that, that is a chain that connects us to God. And if you break one link in that chain, then you're separated from God. Just one link. If you, if you just break one of those commandments, you break one thing you know God says and you don't do, then you're separated from God. But God doesn't want us to live like that. God doesn't want us to continue like that. And so he made a way that we could be reconciled to him. That there's nothing I can do to fix the chain. I, I, can't, I can't reach up to heaven to grab God's part of the chain and lift my part up and, and somehow, you know, get a spiritual welding, you know, thing to put it back together again. Man can't fix it. And so God sent Jesus. And he died on the cross for my sins. And if I believe that, then God replaces my broken chain with the perfect righteousness of Christ. My chain is gone. My chain is replaced. I now relate to God by, on the basis of Christ's sacrifice and his perfect righteousness is something that I can cling to that holds me to God, not just now, but forever. And nothing can break that chain. 
When I receive Jesus Christ, now I know that I have eternity. I have eternal life in heaven because of what Jesus did for me. Now, you shouldn't continue breaking links in the chain, but he's already done all the work. God calls us to cling to that chain. John 14, 6 says this, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Once someone has repented of their sins and received Christ's sacrifice, that, that their broken chain is set aside, replaced by Christ. And I'll tell you what I say to that. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Right? Somebody give me an amen so I know you're still awake out there. Verse 12. So, he says, speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. So speak and so do are both in the um, present active imperative which means we're supposed to, do it, supposed to do it right now. We're to continue doing it, and it's not a suggestion. It is a command. We're going to be judged. All of humanity will be judged. The unbelievers, they will face a judgment, and their judgment will be based on that law, that God's going to evaluate them here is the law, Here, here's the do's and the don'ts, here's the, the commands and the commandments, all of that stuff, all of the instructions, here's all of those, and they'll be judged based on that law. And they'll be judged and condemned as guilty because they rejected the only way of being made right, the only way that they could have been acquitted for their sins, and that is the atoning death of Jesus Christ. If you reject that, then there is no other possibility but a guilty charge. Now, believers, we're not going to be judged for our sins, right? Somebody say, praise Jesus, because I know you got a bunch of them. We're not going to be judged for our sins. Why? Because Jesus took them. Which ones? All of them. He took all of our sins to the cross. He took our condemnation. God judged Jesus on my behalf. And that alone ought to, ought to cause you to fall on your face before God and commit your entire life to him. All of our sins are washed away by his blood. And that means we are clean before God. That even though we are, we are guilty for the sins that we've committed, God doesn't see that. And he looks at us as pure. And then when we go into his presence, which Hebrews tells us to come boldly into his presence, whenever we need grace or mercy, we just come boldly in. Hey, God, and don't be disrespectful, but go in, boldly go in. And it says he will give it freely to us. That's radical. But all of our works will be judged. We will stand before Jesus, and he will judge all of our works to see if they are worthy of heaven. In 1 Corinthians 3, you can look at it later on, it tells us that all of our works will pass through the fire. That they're, they're, they'll, they'll be tested as though going through a fire to see if they are good or bad. And the, those that are good, those that are right before God, those that are, that are in alignment with God's heart, word, and will, those are the ones that will go through and they will be rewarded. But those, who, those that are not good will be burned up. The law of liberty, as James tells us here, is the freedom that we have in Christ to do what is right, not based on a law, not based on, on anything, but what is right in God's word, will, heart, nature, character. 
We do what is right in relation to God and his word in relation to an exp- as an expression of love to others, then we have the freedom to do whatever that is. Our attitudes and our behaviors and our activities, all of these things will be judged based on what is right. The good will be rewarded. Now, I don't know what the rewards are. I just know if there's a reward in heaven, I want it. The bad will be burned up. And, and there will be a sense, and you'll watch it happen. That thing that you did, that you think God is all happy about, and he's going to look at it and say, yeah, no. Eh. That was, you did that with partiality. You did that with an unbelief. You did that for whatever your motivation. You did that because you thought you'd get something out of it. That's, that, that's not good. We ought to do what's right for, the, for just the sake of the fact that it's right. Not because of what somebody will think about it. Not because of how many likes we're going to get or how many follows we're going to get. Not because we think, you know, it's going to earn us some position or whatever. We do it because it's right. And James finishes this text by telling us that there are no do-overs in life. This is, this is kind of a bad news verse. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The topic has been partiality, but it could be, it could be expanded to cover many spiritual things. That, that when we don't show mercy in the case of this idea of partiality, we treat this person be, this way because of, of this outward appearance or this person, we don't treat that way. But we're not showing them mercy. We're not being kind. We're not being right. We're not doing what is right in God's economy. And God would say that, that, that that's not good. Now, 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 this is a verse I don't know that we like. I don't know, I don't know like we like the idea that this could be true. It is true because God says it. But humanly speaking, we don't like the idea that there is a point of no return. When it comes to the mercy of God, we want that to be limitless. That no matter what happens, no matter what we do, that we want God's mercy to be limitless. But it's very clear in Scripture that it's not. Now, there's no limit to how much mercy that God can show. His mercies are new every day, but there is a point. God is perfect, perfect in his righteousness. And in his perfect righteousness, he must judge sin. What sin? All of it. All of it. And because God is love, he made a way for anyone to be cleansed, to to be forgiven of their sins, right? It's Jesus Christ. If I turn to Jesus Christ, I repent of my sins, then all my sins are forgiven, every last one of them. And God is free to pour out his mercy on me without end because that's the way he organized the universe. But when someone receives Christ, they're going to receive mercy rather than judgment. That's just the way that God has arranged it. But once the threshold that God has placed, God has, God has put a threshold out there, he's put a boundary line, he's put a limit, and says, don't cross this line. If you cross this line, there will be no more mercy. There's an end. And if you cross that line, if someone goes that far, and, and for many it's going to be they end this life without repenting of their sins, then there's no hope for mercy. The only thing left is judgment. We're, gonna, we're in chapter 6 of Revelation on Tuesday mornings. And we're talking about the reality that the tribulation period, that, 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 that while there still is mercy and grace available, we're seeing it being, we're seeing the limit of God's grace being displayed to us. Once you cross that limit, once you cross that line, once you cross that threshold, there is no more mercy. 
And our prayer ought to be for all of those out there who have not experienced, have not, have not, you know, have not crossed that limit yet. So we don't know. We don't know when somebody's gone too far. We don't know when, some, when God has said, okay, that's it for them. For us, there's always hope. As long as there's life, there is hope. And we pray for that person. We need to pray for that person. They need to repent because the idea of ending, of leaving this life and not experiencing the mercy of God should be too terrible for us to even imagine. We should hate the very idea of it. It should sicken us to imagine anybody leaving this life without salvation in Jesus Christ because it is a horror too great for us as humans to imagine, and we ought to just hate the idea of it, and we ought to cry, we ought to fall on our face before God and beg him to save them. Amen. Don't wait. If you're here and you haven't received Christ, you need to do it today. No man has promised tomorrow. We have no idea what the future holds. We have no idea if this is the last Hurrah, do it today. The book of James is a very practical book. And here he's talking to the church primarily. He's talking, telling the church how they ought to behave, right? You know, this is what you ought to do. You ought to treat each other in the church without partiality. That's what he's saying to the church. That extends beyond the church, but that's the point. That's the purpose. And I want to close this message by talking about this church about our church. One of the things I love about this church, and, and okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not paid to love this church, okay? I, I'm paid to work here, but I'm not paid to love it, but I do love this church. I love this church for a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons is because we, are, we tend to be a friendly church. We love each other. I mean, that you see a sincere joy when people get together and they, they see them. I mean, there was a couple of faces I haven't seen in a long time. Ah, you know, you just, you, 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 you're, you just sense it. There's something special about that. It's, it's, well, at least for those who want that. I mean, some people show up at church and they just show up. You know, they don't want to be a part of the tribe or, or whatever. And I'm going to love you anyways. But I, I love when people come and they just want to know God's love. And the way you do it is by, by loving each other. And when you, when you love each other, just something, it changes the environment and the atmosphere. And I love that about this church. There is a, a sincere joy that people have when they're here. We need that, right? We are a community of people who, who are doing our best to love God and love other people, to love our neighbors. Now, now we're doing our best, but we're imperfect. So if we don't do it perfectly, give us a little grace. I'm still working on Kelly. She's getting better every day. <laughs> I'm going to pay for that one later. Not from her. Not from her. All the rest of the women's ministry is going to get me. <laughs> no, she is much better at it than I do. She's way better at loving people than I am. And there's a temptation that we have within, within any community, but within, including within the church, of developing unhealthy tribalism. You know, I, I, I look at the church as a tribe, the tribe of Calvary Chapel, French Valley. We are a tribe, a community of people that gathers together with a purpose. We're here for a reason. But we can develop unhealthy tribalism. We call them in the church cliques. Anybody ever heard that? You know, your, your church is filled with cliques. Well, yeah, that is just natural. You, you put any group of people together of any size, little groups will start forming within the bigger group. It's natural. We do it all the time. Anywhere you go, that happens because it's in our nature to do it. It doesn't have to be unhealthy. It can actually be good. I mean, an example of that for us is our men's ministry. We have a men's ministry. There's a small group of men that loves being around each other. And they get together and they laugh and they joke and they, they actually do, you know, Bible stuff too. But, you know, it's, it's, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, it's good. You know, they're gathering together 
because, you know, they have a purpose, their, their purpose or gathering as a, as a tribe within the tribe is to disciple men on how to be better Christian men and all of the ways that we might define that, all the ways that we might describe that. And there's only one qualification for being a part of that, of that group, of that clique. You know what it is? Be a man. That's it. Don't even have to be a good one. Right? Because we we've let all kinds of weird ones in. Don't look around. We want men to be a part of that group, to be a part of that clique, that little tribe. Why? Because it builds when we gather together, that little group gathers together, they are building each other up and making themselves stronger, which then makes the whole church stronger. Now, if they're going to hold their faith without partiality, which is what James started off this chapter to t telling us to do, then they need, they need to be welcoming to whom? Any man that wants to come who desires to be a better Christian man, even if they're not sure what they want. They need to be welcoming. Not only welcoming, they ought to be inviting men into that. Same thing applies to this church. Who should be welcome here? No, nope, not everyone. They have to be divinely created image bearers. So that's everyone. <laughs> if they're a divinely created image bearer, they should be welcome here. And who should welcome them? All of us. But we know how it is. Somebody comes in, mm, they look different. They don't look like a part of our tribe. And our natural tendency You go stand over there. Or something like that. That's not God's heart. God's heart is anybody will come through those doors ought to feel welcome here. Ought to feel the love of God here. Now, it doesn't mean that we're going to be okay with everything they might be doing. But they'll be welcome. And our hope, our prayer is that if they know and they experience the love of God, if they, if, they are, if they come and they experience the gathering of the body together to worship God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, as we are faithful to the best that we're able to give them the word of God, that the spirit of God is going to reach down into their hearts and lives and transform them into what he wants them to be, not what we want them to be. That if there's things that are wrong in their life, then God's going to do a work. After all, we did let all of you in here. <laughs> there are some people, they wear their sin on the outside. There are others, they, they just hide it really good. Doesn't matter. They ought to be welcome here. They ought to feel welcome here. They ought to know that God is in this place, that his people love him they love each other, and they want to love them. Now, not everybody is lovable. Not everybody's easy to love, but we want to love them, as God would call us to, through faith and obedience. Trust God to do a radical work in them. Romans 2.4. Do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Listen, if we start evaluating who people are before we make them welcome in this church, we're not the kind of church that God wants us to be. We have to trust God to do that work. And until God does it in them, we need to welcome them. We need to love them. We need to show them grace and mercy. We need to be patient with them. We need to do whatever we can. Now, again, we don't, we're, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna be truth tellers, and we're going to stand on the truth, whatever that means. But it should not limit who comes in, this, in these doors. 
with the possible exception of wolves. We don't let any wolves in. Somebody comes in to harm this church, the leaders of this church are going to stand up and protect this flock with our very lives if we have to. But if somebody comes in and they're just different, there can be only one response. Love. Now, I, again, I am blessed to be a part of this church. I believe that is our nature. Again, we're imperfect, so we do that imperfectly. But it's all things. I think we can do it better. And the better we do at practicing it here, then equips us better to do it out there, which is where it really matters. It matters here, but it really matters out there that everybody that comes in contact with you needs to know one thing above everything else is that you love. You love. Now, how that's going to manifest in each situation and circumstance is going to be different based on this you and the circumstance you're in. But that ought to be your foremost thought. How do I love here? I know God loves, but how do I do it right here with this person? Without judging them, without questioning them, without evaluating them based on these, all these externals, I've got to start at the very beginning because I believe that is what God would do. Now, that's not easy, right? Because there's some really unlovable people out there. And we are living in a society that, that is, is seeking to divide over every conceivable way of dividing our culture. And, and they would tell you, you don't have to love somebody if they're outside of your tribe. Matter of fact, it's okay to hate them. And not just hate them, but to, you know, to harm to them. That's not God. That's not right. This is not the easy way, but it's the right way to love and to express love and to do love wherever we possibly can because that is the way that they're going to see God. And if they can see God, they might be able to find their way to him. And if they can find their way to him, then they can find the forgiveness of sins that we enjoy. And they can know the hope that we have. And that should be our great desire, right? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time, this place. I thank you for this church. I thank you for these people and their love for you and their love for one another. And I do pray, Lord God, that, that while I, I believe we're doing a really good job at it, we can always be better. That, that all of us can be about the ministry of love. Now, we, we, we all might be called to different kinds of ministry, like me preaching and teaching, and uh, Larry to playing the guitar, and and Jeremy to running the sound and, and, and all the different things that people are doing around here, but all of us are called to the same ministry of love. And so I pray, Lord God, that we would all see every person that comes in this place as part of our ministry and that we would seek to express your love to them, whether they look like us or not, whether we're, whether we're familiar with them or not, whether, whether we like them or not, whether whatever outward definitions we might use that we would seek to love no matter what and that we would get rid of these evil thoughts and partiality and and judging people based on what we can see in them and that we would see them as those divinely created image bearers of you whether they're bearing your image well or poorly they were created for that purpose, and we should love them that way. So we do pray here today, Lord God, that you would help us to do that. Help us to do it better, and help us to carry that idea out into this world. That when people come in contact with us, they would see us not judging them. But they would recognize your love dwelling in our heart. And through that love, maybe, just maybe, they'll come into the very presence of the God who loves him, them and sent his son to die for them. And maybe, just maybe, they'll give us an opportunity to tell them about our Savior. And so I pray, Lord, help us to be vehicles of your love. Lord, if there's anyone here who has not made that transition, 
who has not, who has not decided for you, Jesus. If they're, if they're not sure that, Lord God, you're probably doing something in their heart right now, maybe creating a sense of your presence, maybe questions are coming, maybe something tugging at their heart, that's you, God, calling them to repentance, calling them to salvation, calling them to put their trust in you. And Lord, if they're doing, if they're sensing that today, don't wait, don't wait. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the time to give your heart to Christ. Now is the time to love God with all of yourself. So if you're here today and you've never received Christ as your savior, do it now. Open your heart to him. Pray this simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. I recognize that, that, that I have done things in my life, that I have broken the chain that binds me to God, and that there's nothing I can do. There is no hope that I can fix it myself, that only by giving my life to you can I reconnect with the God who loves me. So I receive you right now as my Lord and Savior. I receive your sacrifice for my sins. And I believe now that I am connected to God, both now and forever. And I now have the hope of heaven. And Lord, for all of us, thank you for this day. And we pray. Lord God, you'd help us to walk in faith out of this place in a way that shows the whole world what we believe and that what we believe is that God loves us and loves them too. We thank you, Lord, for this day and we give it to you now in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Have a radical week in Jesus, amen. Thank you for joining us on this exciting journey through the book of James. It's our hope that these messages will help you to grow in your faith. If you have any questions or there's anything that we can do to help you with that, please don't hesitate to connect with us. You can reach out to us at calvaryfe slash connect to find all the different ways that you can connect with us. As believers, as Christians, we are all connected in Christ. And one of the ways that we'd like to engage with you is in prayer. Please let us know how we can be praying for you. You can send us an email to prayer at calvaryfv.com or text the word pray to 951-419-5396. If this material has been useful to you, please share it with someone and let them know how it blessed you. Also, please pray that God would use these messages to help others find hope in Jesus Christ. You can also partner with us financially by going to calvaryfv.com slash give or text the word give to 951-419-5396. Until next time, go be radical with Jesus.